Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest with us this morning. That's right. Dr. Peniel Joseph. That I just yeah. found out is from Queens, New York. Yes, absolutely. Thank well, Dr. Peniel, put your phone down. We're doing an interview. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to put the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the cover of the book. My, oh, my we'll people... put it in the video. Okay. Oh, good. we got it. We got yeah. you. We got you. We got you. From South Jamaica, Queens. <laughs> South Jamaica, Queens, 109th Avenue and Springfield Boulevard. Now, tell us how you grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, because South Jamaica, Queens is not an easy area to grow up. You got, you got to go through a lot of things growing up as a kid. So what was your zone school, Andrew Jackson? My, my zone school was Andrew Jackson. My mom sent uh, me and my brother to uh, private school. We went to Catholic school. What school did you go to? I went to Holy Cross and St. Joaquin and Anne. So we, we're, I'm the proud son of Haitian immigrants who came to the United I, States. Hey, hey sac passé. Sac passé, not boule. Uh, I, so went to, I went to St. Joe I went to St. Joe Manan as well. All right, I went, yeah. I went, I went to St. Francis. So for people out there, Andrew Jackson, the reason I asked him is his zone school, it was the first high school in the country to have metal detectors. So if yeah. you lived in Queens, most yeah. parents, they would really try to work hard so your son didn't have to go to that school because that was my zone school as well Absolutely. and try to put him in a better school. But that was that first school. He's the, the, On the cover of LL Cool J's album, he was actually in front of Andrew Jackson. But that's what I always ask. So how did you get into writing, brother? How did you defeat the odds Leave Jamaica, Queens, Southside with all the drug selling and all the crime and and become a author and a doctor. No, this is uh, this is all because of my my mother. I know C. God, you talk about uh, Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Yes, a sir. Lot. Um, and my mom, same way. She talked to us about the Haitian Revolution. Uh, she talked to us about my mom's a, a black feminist. Uh, she's retired now, 82 years young. I was on my first picket line in New York City outside Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, at seven years old in New York City. Um, so I grew up in a household that talked about social justice, that talked about God, <laughs> that talked about Christianity. Um, my older brother's an ER doctor uh, mm -hmm. in Baltimore, um, and I'm fortunate enough to be a writer and a, and a teacher and really a student, a student. I think the, the only way you can be a writer or a thinker is to constantly um, be searching and, and studying. And that's how I became a student of, of black history, mm -hmm. black power, um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, um, so many others. And I, that's why Dr. Peniel is here today. One of the reasons he's here, man, I read an amazing book called The Sword and the Shield, written by Dr. Peniel Joseph, one of the best books I've ever read. Um, I got around to it about a year late. I know it came out last year in March, but I got to it about a year late. But it really explores the revolutionary lives of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Brother Malcolm X in a very humanizing way. Like, like what made you want to explore them the way that you did? Well, I've always, you know, I'm going to uh, say what Muhammad Ali said about mm -hmm. Malcolm X. He said, I fell in love with Malcolm X when he was debating people and talking to people about black history. So I fell in love with Malcolm X um, by the time I was eight, nine, ten years old. Mm -hmm. uh, the Eyes on the Prize documentary series came out. And this is before Denzel's brilliant movie came out in 1992. I was 19 when wow. that movie came out. Um, so I've always loved Malcolm X. I think my love for Dr. King has come as I've gotten older, as I've become a father, as I've become um, just a, a deeper adult, because you see, one, how uh, Dr. King was radicalized in part by Malcolm X. But, but I've also come to see that uh, certainly we need self-defense, what Malcolm X talked about, but we also mm -hmm. need the beloved community, uh, what Dr. King talked about. So mm -hmm. my, my whole thing was seeing how they... They went from being rivals and adversaries to being each other's alter egos. What, what, what did they okay. learn? I'm sorry, Solomon. What did you learn a lot of this? Because, you know, in, in school, especially growing up, they touched on a lot of it. You know what I mean? It wasn't so deep. Like, it was the I have a dream speech. It was a little bit of Malcolm X. So what made you want to learn more about these characters, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and... You know, it was growing up in New York City, MV. You know, my mother um, was part of uh, hospital workers, uh, SCIU 1199. And so we grew up in a city where we talked about social protest. I was a freshman in high school when Michael Griffith was, was, was murdered uh, in December of 86 in Howard Beach. A white mob chased them out into the highway and the brother was just destroyed by, by, by a fast moving car and was trying to figure all this mm. stuff out in New York City. So this is before David Dinkins. Uh, this is when Eleanor Bumpers, who is a black uh, grandmother, was murdered by the police at, in her own home. That was in Atlanta, right? This was here. That was, this was in New York. Who was the this grandmother was in, in Atlanta? This, I know it was a, This, this was, was in New York, wow. right? 
Um, and so all of that got me interested. But then certainly Eyes on the Prize premiered in New York in 19... 19- uh, 87, 88 on PBS, Channel 13 over here. And we grew up in a New York City where Channel 5, before Fox News, we used to watch the drive-in movies. And you think about Wu-Tang, they talk about Shaolin. Mm-hmm. We 3 p.m. on Saturdays, this is before cable, this is before everything, we used to watch, uh, uh, you know, kung fu movies, right? So it was this idea of you were watching kung fu movies, Hip-hop, Run DMC lived on Hollis, right up the hill. So we used to see Run DMC. We used to be able to go to shows. They used to play at times right in PS34 Park. Um, But there was all this racial segregation. Ed Koch was the mayor of New York. Uh, Ronald Reagan was the president. All that got me interested in Malcolm X. First time I read about Malcolm, my mother had um, the autobiography of Malcolm X in the house, and I read that, and that just got me going. Man, how old are you? Because you were talking like you 50-something. You look like you in your late 20s. <laughs> he was born in 72, I'm, I'm, bro. I'm, 72. I'm, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm 48. Okay, I'm 48. wow. Yeah. Man, what you vegan? A lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of water. A lot of been practicing uh, yoga for 23 years. Okay, okay. And uh, yeah, all, all that good stuff. Yeah. Now, now, what does the metaphor to, uh, uh, in the book's title, The Sword and the Shield, refer to. And I'm glad you asked that. So we usually think about Malcolm X as the political sword of the black freedom struggle. And I even write in this book, Malcolm served as black America's prosecuting attorney. Mm-hmm. So he was prosecuting uh, the United States for crimes against black humanity that dated back to racial slavery. Dr. King is usually think, thought of as the, the shield. He's America's apostle of nonviolence, where uh, Malcolm is Harlem's hero of self-defense. We, we think about the ballot or the bullet speech. We think about Malcolm with a rifle by, by a window, and that's an iconic picture. What I argue in The Sword and the Shield is that both Malcolm and Martin are both. Malcolm X is not only the political sword of the black community, he becomes our prime minister who goes to Africa, right. the Middle East. He becomes El Hajj Malik Shabazz, and he wants to build a beloved community as well, but one that's rooted in truth, and the truth of not just racial slavery, but our West African and our African heritage. So Malcolm is a Pan-African all day, every day, but he's also a Muslim. He's also a radical internationalist. King is not just somebody who's a man of peace. He's a man of peace. He's a man of God. Both of them are men of God. Um, but King is also this nonviolent revolutionary. King becomes so revolutionary after Doc, uh, Malcolm X's death, he, he's no longer on speaking terms with the president of the United States because he comes out against the Vietnam mm-hmm. War. And he starts to say things like, all white Americans have unconscious racism. He says the halls of the U.S. Congress are running wild with racism. In April 4th, 1967, at the Riverside Church in New York, he says that the greatest purveyor of violence in, United, in, in the world is the United States of America. Mm-hmm. So that's the revolutionary king who goes to places like Marks, Mississippi, and tells poor black people that during Reconstruction, they were promised 40 acres and a mule. They didn't get their 40 acres and a mule, but he's going to lead a poor people's caravan to go to Washington, D.C. until they get the 40 acres and a mule. Mm -hmm. That's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So he's both a sword and a shield, but Malcolm is as well. And what I argue in the book is that the person who most influences Dr. King's radicalism is Malcolm X. Yeah. Go ahead, you know, they all, you know, Charlemagne always talks about how Malcolm and X, Malcolm X and Dr. King, uh, Dr. King spoke. Do you think they were assassinated because they were possibly going to join forces and come out together and that would just be too much power? Well, I think they definitely are assassinated because they represent a threat to the American political system. Um, I think that they would have gotten together. They spoke together once on March 26, 1964 at the U.S. Senate. But one little known um, aspect that I get into in the book is that Malcolm saw King in Harlem uh, December 17th, 1964. He was sitting next to Andy Young, Andrew Mm -hmm. Young, a former mayor of Atlanta, a former U.N. ambassador. And he heard Dr. King give a whole speech after King won the Nobel Peace Prize. And not just that, he speaks about that speech in Harlem a few days later and says that it was a terrific speech. He's impressed. And he goes to Alabama to visit with Dr. King. And Dr. King's in prison, and he visits instead with Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's wife, and really political partner. We think of uh, Coretta Scott King as just his wife. 
she's a brilliant organizer, political partner, intellectual. She's his 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 better half. Let's let's face it. And so when we think about Malcolm, Malcolm was ready to join forces with King, but on his own terms. He wasn't going to do the same thing. He Malcolm always believed in black dignity. Uh, King believed in black citizenship. Over time, they both come to believe in black dignity and citizenship. And Malcolm X defined black dignity as the end of world white supremacy. Let, let's, let's dig in on that a little bit more, because I love the concept of radical black dignity. It's weird because I've, I've read the autobiography of Malcolm X a few times. Love Message to the Black Man by Elijah, by Elijah Muhammad. Swear by those books, but I don't remember that concept you know, explored as much as when I read The Sword and the Shield. And I even incorporated a lot of the concept of radical black dignity and a commencement speech I gave for South Carolina State, you know, about a month ago. But can, but can you dig a little deeper on what that is? What is radical black dignity? Radical black dignity for Malcolm X is radical black political self-determination. So what that means is that Malcolm absolutely had this external critique. He critiqued white supremacy. He critiqued institutions that were brutalizing black people, the police, the whole deal. But he also expected a lot of ourselves. So Malcolm defines radical black dignity as black people coming to understand and love themselves through the pain and trauma of racial slavery and segregation and brutalization, that we have to understand that, but we have to not be as hard on ourselves as we usually are. Because Malcolm criticized us for loving white people and loving white supremacy too much. But what that meant was that we weren't able to face how we had been subjugated, mm -hmm. how, how we had been subjugated during racial slavery. Reason why Malcolm X goes to Africa three times, because people don't talk about the 1959 trip to Africa, where he's in Egypt, he's in the Middle East. He meets up with President, Vice President uh, Anwar el-Sadat. He meets up with Prince Faisal, Saudi Arabia, the whole deal. Malcolm went there to the Middle East and to Africa, even before he takes the Hajj, because he knew that black people had a history before the Middle Passage. So part of that dignity was we understood that, yes, not only had we been uh, kings and queens, and obviously not all of us were just kings and queens in Africa, but we had a history before the U.S. We had a history before European, uh, I won't even call it conquest, but being captives here and really recreating Western civilization through our own protests. Another part of radical black dignity is black beauty and black love. Uh, Malcolm, uh, following Marcus Mosiah Garvey, believed in the beauty of black people intrinsically. Black women, black men, black children, black babies, black neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. when we think about this idea of self-determination, and my final point is, this is why Malcolm has a critique of racial integration. Not because he doesn't want an equal society, but Malcolm, was horrified by the fact that it took troops to bring black children to school in Little Rock Central High School in 1957. Mm -hmm. Whereas King writes a, a, a telegram to President Eisenhower applauding that in September of 1957. Malcolm is angry and, and mad about that. Why? It's a sick society where our children, little black girls and boys, have to be uh, uh, have to be guarded by troops to mm -hmm. go into a high school or an elementary school. And that's why Malcolm says American democracy is nothing but American hypocrisy. That's right. And very famously, he says, you can't put a knife nine inches in a person's back, take it out three inches and call that progress. That's right. You haven't taken out the knife and you haven't even acknowledged the wound. So black dignity is us understanding our own struggle, loving ourselves through the joy and the trauma of that struggle. Remember, the reason why Malcolm X is the best order in American history, it, it, and I th I'll say Dr. King is number two. The reason why Malcolm's the best, Malcolm has a great sense of humor. He actually forces us to confront uh, this through, through different parables. And when he talks about house Negroes versus field Negroes, he's talking about black dignity, but he's also talking that we have class tensions in our own community. Um, sometimes you'll have historians and scholars who say, well, the house Negro, field Negro is more complicated than that. Malcolm's given us allegories that everyone can understand. That's why he says, make it plain. So the house Negroes were black folks who had more identification with white supremacy and white masters. And that's why Malcolm says, when the white master got sick, the house Negro said, we, we sick, sick, right? And, and field Negroes, Malcolm defined them like he defined himself. Black people who were catching hell every day and who were bold enough to resist uh, against white supremacy. So black dignity is huge, huge, huge. And this is why when we think about the Malcolm and Martin, the dichotomy and the convergence, 
It's only because of Malcolm X that Dr. King starts talking about black dignity. Dr. King starts saying black is beautiful and it's so beautiful to be black. Dr. King by 1967 tells us that they even tell us little white lies are better than black lives. Black lies. That's Dr. King only because Malcolm X had taught all of us about black dignity. Before Malcolm, we were all Negroes who turned into black people because of Malcolm X. You don't think um, Stokely had anything to do with that, too? Because, I mean, Stokely was Mr. Black Power, you know Oh, what absolutely. Mean? No. Yeah. And I wrote a book about Kwame Ture. Stokely Carmichael is one of my heroes and, and idols, Kwame Ture. He would have been 80 years old on June 29th this year. My birthday. Uh, for Port of Spain, Trinidad, that's a, that's a that's a brilliant day, see God. I think that when we think about Stokely Carmichael, he becomes the biggest popularizer of the Black Power uh, period. What Malcolm X does, though, is he serves as the Godfather, the Avatar, the person who gives us um, basically. Uh, uh, the the tools. Malcolm X becomes Prometheus. When you think about Prometheus and the the, the myth of Prometheus, he steals fire from the gods and gives it to people. And mm-hmm. he's 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 sort of uh, going to be um, uh, he's punished for that. Where his 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 uh, there, there's some creature that's eaten his liver uh, for the rest of his life in eternity, eternity, and then his liver keeps coming back, but the creature keeps eating it. When we think about Malcolm X, he's the Prometheus, he gave us the fire of black dignity uh, and really uh, radical black political self-determination. I agree with uh, Malcolm in, in, in regard to integration, too, because think about that now. You would never force someone to be in a situation that was dangerous for them. You know what I mean? Like, that's nothing to be applauded. Like, I'm not applauding the fact that little black kids got to school, go to school with white kids when they had to have security, probably getting spit on. And you saw them getting pushed and shoved and hit on. Like, no. No, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm racial integration is something uh, that we should be for, but not in a way uh, that causes harm and danger to black people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we want an equal, a just society, racially integrated society for 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 wealth building, for neighborhoods, for public. But let schools. me ask you a question, not, and not to cut you off. What you and Charlemagne just said, when you talk about when you talk about that, right? Does does it make sense? Does it make the world better? And I'm, and I'm gonna ask you why, right? So we have two Americas, right? We know there's two Americas, right? But if you look at Black Wall Street and the things that Black Wall Street Mm -hmm. have, right, and then you look at Wall Street, you know, we're not in Wall Street. And if we are, it's very far and very few. Mm -hmm. So why not have two different Americas where there is, you know, stuff where, you know, we have our own police policing. So we don't have to worry about, say, a white police officer being scared because somebody doesn't look like them and doesn't know our culture, doesn't know that we wear do rags, wear hoods, wear hats, doesn't know our culture yep. and is automatically scared. You know, we can go to a bank and an officer is not, you know, less likely to give us money because of the color of our skin where we have our own community where they know, you know, who we are, you know, what we do, the jobs that we do, the jobs that we offer and, and the things that we have, you know, going in at a, at a bank and saying I'm a DJ. You know, most officers would be like, yeah, get the fuck out of here. I'm not even <laughs> but, but if I go to, uh, you know, a black bank who somebody who might have heard me on a breakfast club or who knows who I am, I'd be like, oh, I know who that is. Yes, we can do it. You understand what I'm saying? No, I would hear what you're saying. To have two different yeah. Americas and, and do it. Would, would that be bad? Well, Envy, I think that we have parallel institutions already. Like what, what you're talking about exists through historically black colleges, black banks. Um, but I think you do need racial integration. That's not racial integration at the point of a gun, but racial integration so you can actually spread the wealth and have um, more access and not just opportunity, but outcomes for black people. Because the separate but equal really doesn't work. And even when you think about investments in black communities to abolish prisons, uh, to reimagine public safety or defund the police, whatever you want to call it, doing it off of two tiers doesn't doesn't work like right now and and i could talk to you all about politics and black folks all day long the 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 biden pandemic bill the reason why that's positive for black people including black farmers got five billion dollars is is that racial equity it's a 1.9 trillion dollar bill racial equity has been written in that bill where Black and Latinx child poverty is supposed to go down 50 percent in the next 24 months because of that bill. It's harder to do it separate. That's why separate but equal. That's the 1896 uh, Supreme Court decision. Um, It didn't it didn't work. And obviously it was always separate but unequal. So I think you need both. I think you need parallel black institutions. Absolutely. You need you need black wealth. 
You need investment in our communities. Uh, you need investment in black entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and private equity and hedge, hedge funds. I'm there with you all day, I'm, I'm, every I'm day. Asking, um, right, but, for instance, but, NBA, 74% of the players are black. Yes. How many, how many owners are black? It, I, I don't know if we have a black owner. One, it's, Michael it's, Jordan. It's Michael Jordan, yeah, Charlotte. It, Charlotte. Same thing yeah. with football. Yeah. You know, how many owners are black? But that you might know, be, you know, envy, that's... About music. You know, how many owners of mm -hmm. are black? None. You know, you, they can say they own their own label, but they don't own the distribution. They don't yeah. own... They, it's still people that own it over them, you know? So it's it's like... But I think that's a case where that's a great case for why you you need both because you're like, well, why aren't there more Robert F. Smiths? Why aren't there more Oprah Winfrey's, Michael Jordan? Part of this is the fact that you've never had um, uh, capitalism operate in a in a race neutral fact uh, facet, right? So capitalism has always been racist and segregated, and those who are successful, like all of you all at the Breakfast Club, are 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 really outliers. What Malcolm Gladwell calls mm -hmm. outliers right. because. Capitalism isn't meant to work for us. It's meant to work on us through super exploitation. So the reason why we want more racially integrated communities is that when you think about wealth and something like the pandemic bill, back in the day when they passed something like that during the New Deal, black people were expressly not part of it. The New Deal is two-tiered liberalism. The historian Ira Katz Nelson calls it affirmative action for whites. White people got all the benefits of the New Deal and the GI Bill, and black people were left out of Social Security, domestic workers, maids, sharecroppers, right? So when when the big money has been spent historically on the second world war on the new deal we got basically zero we got sky rise projects instead of the levitt towns that white people got long island the only reason why you got and i went to school in long island long island the only reason it's built the way it's built is because of the new deal and robert moses was the power broker the city builder in New York who segregated the whole damn city, built up the major Deegan Expressway and took out black communities while doing it. And they did it in Overtown, Miami. They've done it in North Carolina, South Carolina. This, this idea of gentrification as urban renewal, but it's really, we called it Negro removal in the 1950s and 60s. And it's still that way in downtown Brooklyn up until this day. It's happening in Austin, Texas, where I live now. So you want racial integration, but I agree with you, parallel institutions. I'm down with Howard University all day, every day. My brother graduated from Howard University. I'm down with black uh, businesses and, and, and black people who are gonna be entrepreneurs and social justice activists all day, every day for the rest of my life. But at the same time, we need to be part of the bigger slice of the pie, right? And demanding our share. Envy, if we had 12.7% of the wealth in the country, because we are 12.7% of the people in the country, we would be golden. We have less than 2% of the wealth. If we had 12.7% of venture capitalists and private equity and hedge fund investment and, and ownership, we would be golden. If we were 12.7% of owners in the NBA and the NFL, we would be golden right now. We could take care of ourselves. And we don't have that. And part of the reason we don't have that is that we don't, there's not enough power in building parallel institutions to get your fair and equitable share in this country. Mm. Let, let's talk about uh, Dr. King's concept of radical black citizenship. And this is where we don't talk about this radical uh, King in our own time, because every year we trot out King as a plaster paper saint. We trot out King as Santa Claus, a black Santa Claus <laughs> who was willing to love and hug white folks and forgive them for, for their sins. King is one of the most uh, radical revolutionary figures who ever lived. And his idea of radical black citizenship, the reason this is so heavy is that Dr. King was talking about not just ending racial oppression, but he says that citizenship has certain prerogatives and certain rights. He says it's decent housing. Dr. King even talks about food justice way before you had people talking about food justice and, and black people eating uh, three square meals a day. Yeah, you have to have some soul food, but you need some greens and some vegetables and other mm -hmm. things in there too, so your babies can survive and thrive. King talked about not just voting rights, but, but, but uh, uh, racial desegregation, the end of police brutality. King negotiates with big city police chiefs in New York and L.A. after Malcolm had negotiated with those big city police chiefs. So way before people were talking about defund the police and abolish prison, 
Malcolm and King are saying the same thing. So King's notion of radical black citizenship is a universal basic income. Before Andy Yang was talking about universal basic income, Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about it. So it's food justice, it's environmental justice, it's decent housing. But he also said that he wanted an end to war and violence in the United States. And that's where people got really, really scared and panicked because King knew that Vietnam was going to be the first of many endless wars. And we continue to have these endless wars right now. We've got troops everywhere. Um, it's not just going to be Afghanistan It's and, and Iraq. It's, it's everywhere. It's not just Grenada. It's not just uh, 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 Vietnam. We, we have endless wars, an endless war budget. And King said the only way we could have true peace was to stop being a fomenter of violence globally. So radical black citizenship for King is anti-racist, but it's more than that. It's centering racial justice and economic equality for all for all people, irrespective of of of, of race, uh, caste, color, sexuality, the whole nine. Who do, who do you identify with more, Ma- Malcolm or Martin, at at any time in their lives? Yeah, you know, the thing is, because I'm from New York City, I, you know, I'm always going to love Malcolm X. I mean, Malcolm X is is is, is the, the person who, 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 besides my mother, I think, who got me most involved in in political activism and being being a writer and being a thinker. Malcolm X went to prison for 77 months. So everybody who's locked up or has family who's locked up, 1946 to 1952, uh, three different prisons in Massachusetts, um, Concord, Norfolk, and Charlestown. And uh, he turns prison uh, into uh, higher education right. for himself. He, 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 he defeats the odds and becomes this intellectual. He becomes this um, Muslim religious leader. Uh, he becomes uh, an organizer and activist. So I, I'd say that Malcolm's ability to uh, think about dignity in such a panoramic way is is huge and hugely important. And I, I definitely think when you think about the Malcolm X who comes back from the Hajj, El Hajj Malik Shabazz in May of 1964, he talks about the dignity of our struggle. That's what, you know, one of the things he tells the press and the press is telling him when he comes back that, hey, there's there's white people who are loving you because you wrote these postcards saying that white people can be part of the movement. I saw all these white folks who are Muslims. And he says that no matter what kind of dignity that white people all around the world want to give to me, unless they provide that same dignity to every single black and African person across the world, it's meaningless to me. And we're going to struggle, uh, uh, you know. For, for forever to get this. So I think that Malcolm X is, is usually important for me. And also the Malcolm who's at Oxford University in December of 1964 gets a standing ovation when he tells the crowd that he's going to organize with anyone, uh, irrespective of race, but who has a revolutionary commitment to transforming what he calls in 1964 the miserable condition on the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. You know what's so interesting about Malcolm and Martin, and you explore it in the book so well, or at least that's what I, I, I got it. You know, M- Malcolm was way more morally sound than Martin. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about the, the evolved Malcolm. Yeah. One, not, not Malcolm Little. Once he became Malcolm X, he was just way more morally sound than Martin. Why, why do you think that picture is not painted more? What, you know, what, what do you mean, morally sound? What do you What do you mean? I mean, Martin and I love Brother King, but Martin was cheating on his wife. He, you know, didn't believe in women being in leadership roles. Yeah. Nowadays, he'd be considered a womanizer, yeah. misogynistic. You know, yeah. Malcolm was faithful to his woman, as far as we know. Oh yeah, you know, hundred percent. Like you know, yeah. No, I think I think you know what's interesting about there's there's one thing I'll say, see God. There's there's two types of morality. There's um our own personal morality, what we do with our partners. Mm-hmm. Um, and our children and our family. And then there's a larger secular ethical mor- morality, meaning mm-hmm. like, hey, if you run a company or a nonprofit, are you taking any money? Mm-hmm. Are you just doing what you're supposed to do and you're not embezzling, cheating? So I'd say that both of them have the larger morality. Right? Yes. You know, th- they both have uh, personal sincerity, political integrity. They have that. But then they're but just human. Then they're, they're just human. Yeah. So I'd say that, the, like you said, the early Malcolm Little, before he becomes Malcolm X, He's the he's a womanizer. Yeah. He's he's you know he's pimping, taking drugs. He documents all this. Everyone, by the way, they call him the Satan. Of, of Malcolm. <laughs> they call him Satan um, when he gets to prison. 
Um, but once Malcolm goes to prison in 1946 and comes out, he's paroled from prison uh, on on August 7th, 1952. And by 1954, he's going to be at West 116th Street and he's going to be the head of Muslim Mosque number seven. He doesn't drink. He doesn't take drugs. He never takes money. And what's interesting for, for all of us who think about now, we know about IPOs and we know about um, unicorns and stuff. Malcolm actually brands the Nation of Islam and turns an uh, organization had four or five hundred members mm -hmm. into this IPO that has over 50,000 mm -hmm. and that is making millions of dollars and it's tax exempt as a religious organization. He doesn't make a dime from that organization. They eventually fire him with no safety net, with no package. Right. That's right. So when people always say, hey, Malcolm couldn't organize people that last year, he had organized this organization that was too big to fail, an organization that's still around, by the way. He had organized one of the greatest um, political organizations and religious organizations of all time that made tens of millions of dollars, that's, that owned so much real estate in Chicago, New York, around the world. That was his work, right? And well, the was, Honorable was, Elijah Muhammad, too. We can't. I, 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 the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, all, all respect there, but the person who does the work. Like, Malcolm utilizes, it's almost like, um, what if... Uh, uh, You've got you've got Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs in that context is more of like a figurehead. And there's somebody right underneath who's doing laying all the groundwork for the iPhone, who's who's laying all the groundwork for all the products that are going to make Apple Apple. Right. But isn't the and blueprint, the, the blueprint, the architect of it would be the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. The, I think the architect of of aspects of Malcolm's success, yes, mm -hmm. it is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but I also think that he goes and transcends beyond that architect mm -hmm. even while he's there. So, I agree with that. Yeah, you, 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 he, couldn't, he couldn't have done it alone because the way in which Malcolm thought at the time when he was in prison and when he came out was that he needed to look up to somebody, mm -hmm. right? Because by the end of his life, he realizes that the person he needs to look up to is just God. You know what I mean? Where mm -hmm. it's not, which to me makes the most sense. That's how I, I grew up too. Um, so, so I think that when we think about Malcolm, what's so extraordinary about Malcolm is that he's able to take that idea and he runs with it in ways that, yes, he's mentored by Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but he takes it off into his own different directions in ways that nobody could have imagined. And he turns them into the, they become such a big organization. By the time they get rid of Malcolm, they get, Cassius Clay and name him Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. becomes this other big global draw, right? Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, the reason why he comes to the Nation of Islam, and he says it, it's Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Elijah Muhammad. It was Malcolm X who mentored him and he was inspired to be. But of course, because Elijah Muhammad is going to have the money, they're going to have the guns, they're going to have the organization, so that's who you go with. But it was the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, Muhammad Ali even said that. He never said, you know, uh, the the Honorable Minister Malcolm X teaches. You know what I mean? He's, it's always the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches. So I, to me, and I'm just putting it in hip-hop terms because that's what we understand. To me, it's kind of like Andre Harrell and Diddy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like Andre had Uptown, but then Diddy took what he learned from Uptown, created Bad Boy, yeah. and took it further than Andre could ever have imagined. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. To me. That's a good but, but let me ask you a question. When you talk no. about the moral ground of, of Martin Luther King Jr., do, do you... Can you actually, it, it, it's, it's a difficult thing because you, you say great man, great speech, he fought for our community. But then on the other end, you know, you say some of the other things that he was a, a, a womanizer, they would say, or that, you know, he didn't believe women should be in, in strong political or whatever he believed. So, so you know, how do you, you mesh that? How, how do you say, I respect you for this, but then this I don't respect? Easily. <laughs> Here's the thing. The way in which I reconciled it is that, and, and see, God, you were saying this earlier, is that he's human. So Dr. King, and I think his, his womanizing um, is a flaw, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a personal failure. I also a sign of the times, though. It's, it's, a, it's a sign of the times. It's, you know, it's, it's a very patriarchal time. You know, it still is, uh, but, but I'm not trying to excuse him, and I don't excuse Malcolm's um, failures in that realm, too. I think what you see with Malcolm is that he's evolving faster when it comes to uh, women and women's equality. Uh, I'm not going to say Malcolm ever becomes a feminist because of the trips to Africa. He says in one of his last interviews that when you go to Africa, the best nations, women are equals. They're right. both running uh, the revolutionary uh, organizations, right? With Dr. King, I think Dr. King 
um, is coming slower to that in terms of there are strong women around him at times like Ella, Ella Baker, Baker, who's the founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But sometimes, you know, sometimes it's because of sexism. Sometimes King just has um, personal disputes with people, right? Sometimes you just don't have chemistry with people. But I think if Dr. King had survived would he have become better about that? I think so. And I, I think that when we think about the Black Lives Matter movement, BLM has been really incredible because you have so many black feminists, black revolutionary women, black queer women um, who are are running the show. And it's really an evolution in our leadership because black women, when you um, follow black feminist uh, thought, and if you're a student of black feminism, which which I am, uh, one of my mentors is Sonia Sanchez, the legendary poet uh, who I studied with at Temple University. You know, since the 18th and 19th century, have been talking about this idea of of intersectionality, and all that means is that our our entire identities are wrapped up in in a multitude of issues. So you think about race, class, gender, geography. You know, see God, you, you you've said before. Uh, you know, uh, Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Reason why that's so important, our identity. Like South Carolina, after the Civil War, was the only Southern state in the in 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 what was now the the disunion after the Civil War with a majority Black population. So South Carolina was on its way, if not for white supremacy and the so-called redemption movement, to having a Black governor. Uh, to having and they did have congressional figures and they did have a spate of local officials because when we think about the reconstruction period there was about 2000 black folks who served uh as as uh, as as sheriffs mm -hmm. uh, as magistrates as um um uh, they served on juries uh and they served obviously in congress but they served in state assemblies and municipal uh leadership as judges right and so south carolina becomes really key there because there's a different history for a place like South Carolina than what you see today with Lindsey Graham and different stuff. If 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 justice had continued from 1865 on. Right. That's how deep mm -hmm. it goes. So so when when you think about um, um, this this period that we're talking about, uh, people like Malcolm and Martin, they are part of America's second reconstruction. I'm writing a book now on America's third reconstruction called called um, A Nightmare is Still a Dream. That'll be out in the fall, and hopefully I can talk to you Please all about it. Um, yeah. And A Nightmare is Still a Dream, America's Third Reconstruction. I argue that 2008 to 2021 is a third period of reconstruction with Obama's election, uh, with the rise of BLM 1.0, the backlash against Obama with the Tea Party, the rise of Donald Trump and MAGA, and then BLM 2.0 and George Floyd. But what's so interesting about MAGA and Trump and Obama is that we had been here before. So the, the three pivot points, when we think about the first, second, and third reconstruction, first reconstruction is a ratification of the 13th Amendment, December 6th, uh, 1865. And we can even start it with Juneteenth, 1865 in Galveston, Texas. Black folks finding out in Texas that freedom is here and freedom that not was given, but we earned 200,000 black folks fought in the Civil War. Always important to remember that. So that's one, 13th Amendment. The second is the Brown Supreme Court decision, the desegregation decision, May 17th, 1954, which announces that public schools can't be segregated. Um, and that's going to start a whole firestorm in the South and the whole country. The third is going to be November 4th, 2008, the election of Barack Obama. So those are the three pivot points that those promise new a new regime, a new era of black citizenship and dignity. And what you do is get a mixed bag. So sometimes people try to say Reconstruction ended in 1876 after that election and the troops were withdrawn in 1877. It's not true. Reconstruction continues through over three decades, including in places like South Carolina, into the 1870s, into the 1880s, into the 1890s. I would probably say its technical end is Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, after a white riot that's connected to the January 6th white, white riot that removes a duly elected uh, uh, black and white government in Wilmington, North Carolina, right? So before we saw the January 6th riot, we had riots all throughout the mm -hmm. United States, right? We had them in Memphis, in New Orleans, but the, the last super, one of the last big ones while black people had political power in the South was that Wilmington riot.
right? So this is all of a piece. This is all of a piece. So Malcolm and Martin are leaders who are part of the second reconstruction, this, this period from mm -hmm. um, uh, the Brown decision all the way to Dr. King's assassination, where we're trying to, um, on some ways, finish the complete the unfinished business of the first reconstruction but i would argue that the first and the third reconstructions are even more radical and revolutionary because we know what's up mm -hmm. in some ways what malcolm and martin were trying to do was um a political revolution but the movements initially were much more interested in reform where this reconstruction is talking about reparations it's talking about wealth mm -hmm. it's talking about all these big things that were talked about in the first reconstruction, because remember, 40 Acres and the Mule starts uh, in Port Royal, South Carolina with the Port Royal experiment, mm -hmm. where we were given, we had earned it, but land and plots of land to cultivate um, as early as 1862 and 1863. And interview's gotta go, well, but I got a few more questions for go, you. So I just wanna say thank you so much, and I can't wait to uh, meet you in person, and when you come back for your other book, but I just want to say I appreciate you and I can't wait to meet you in, in person, brother. Hey, thank you, brother. It was really a pleasure. It's an honor. I, I, I want to go back to, uh, you know, talking about, you know, Malcolm and Martin. I think they definitely would have evolved. Right. We forget how young these brothers were. They were both assassinated at 39. So you think they were both men of the times. So a lot of the things that we even call sexism, misogyny, I don't even think they were on that back then. I just think that's the that, that's what the times were. Yeah, I mean, there, there was there, there's going to be black women who who are and, and women just generally who are talking about, obviously, feminism and mm -hmm. talking about equitable and, and, and equal rights and just justice. But certainly they are imbibing what is a mainstream patriarchy at a time. Great example is the fact that no black women can speak at the March on Washington. Yep. I mean, that's mm -hmm. insane mm -hmm. from from where we're at right now. Rosa Parks, they they call out her name and they give her they give her the head nod just mm -hmm. like that. I mean, that's Rosa Parks. Word. Rosa's one of the organizers of the Montgomery bus boycott, right? Um, um, Gloria Richardson, who was in Cambridge, Maryland, who was known as the Lady General of the Civil Rights Movement, she's there for, for but she's not really allowed to speak. Lena Horne, so many different people. So they embrace the patriarchy of the time. Um, and so, yeah, you I, when I talk about their shortcomings, I definitely say that they are men of the time. So we have to always critique people in the context of their time. So I agree there. You think based on the rules of this time in this society and this BS cancel culture, <laughs> do you think this generation would have accepted Martin and Malcolm in spite of, you know, Malcolm's past and Martin's flaws? You know, I think they would because I think that, you know, uh, th th there are multiple kinds of cancel culture, right? And I think part of the, you know, I agree with Michael Eric Dyson, who's a friend who said that s some of the reason why there's a cancel culture and we're not talking about the cancel culture that that um on some levels uh, conservatives will say when you talk about racism that's cancel culture right yeah but we're talking about the cancel culture that personally people make mistakes and instead of sort of embracing them with empathy we 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 just want them out of our way some of this has to do with just a lack of power that that black folks that communities lgbt communities mm -hmm. the folks have and they feel like hey this is the way to to shut down something that's much more systemic than this one person making a mistake. So I, I, I agree there. I, I think that King and Malcolm had so much, because the three things that I say in the book that they have converged together is personal sincerity, uh, political integrity, and unapologetic love for black people. I think that shines so so much through. And I've, I've met um, uh, black and white celebrities before and politicians who, um, when you see them off camera, they don't necessarily love the people the way they might appear to love them on camera. Right? Absolutely. And what's so interesting about Malcolm and Martin is that you don't find one instance when you do the research of them turning away or somehow being um, disgusted by the least of these. You know, Dr. King in Alabama, Dr. King in Mississippi, Malcolm in Harlem. Malcolm in prison, right? They embraced all of us, right? They embraced aspects of the black community that other parts of the black community sometimes find grotesque, right? So what, what I love about these brothers is how much they loved us. That, that really, I mean, I can be moved to tears to, 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 to talk about it. You know they why they were us. able to do that? Because of their flaws. You know what I mean? Because yeah. Malcolm was that yeah. before he evolved. Because Martin 
still did have his flaws where, where he was he wasn't perfect. So he, he they didn't act like so they were able to embrace everybody because they understood everybody. I Absolutely, think. and that's where you get beyond like um, the so-called cancel culture in the sense that when people make mistakes, we want we want to. Um, I love Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is one of my my, my heroes. Uh, Equal Justice Initiative, uh, but also the the memorial uh, that he's done in, in in Alabama. But his book, Just Mercy, mm-hmm. and and this idea that we all deserve, um, and this the Bible teaches us this, but we all deserve unmerited grace, right? Absolutely. So if we if we give that, because all of us, I think we give it to our children the easiest. That's who we give it to. We give it to our children. Sometimes we don't even give it to our parents as much as we should give it to them, but we give it to our children. And and if we could do that for uh, for each other, it, it would be a better world. And that, that's where we get back to Dr. King's beloved community. One speech of King's that I keep going back to is a speech that he has in 1968 called Remaining Awake, uh, through a time of a, in a time of a great revolution. And he gets deep into uh, why we need a revolution of values. And he defines that revolution of values in the same way we're talking about it now. He says that we need to give each other grace, you know? And that means black people giving each other grace, mm-hmm. but then interracially and across races, right? You think about black, white, Asian, indigenous, South Asian. Um, giving each other grace and unmerited grace and empathy is the only way we can we can move forward. And that doesn't mean that you don't have your principles and say, hey, here's what I stand for. But this idea of of um, trying to destroy people's lives over a mistake, um, people uh, not being able to get employment over a tweet when they were in high school. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Th- that, that, that's not that's not where we should be at. Yeah, it feels very J. Edgar Hoover-ish. You know what I mean? Do, do you think people really grasp how diabolical J. Edgar Hoover and Cointelpro were? Because not, not only did they go out of their way to ruin our leaders' reputations and characters, they actually assassinated our leaders, like really took them out. That's real canceling. Well, you know, I don't think people know anymore. I think there was a time that the FBI had a real, real bad name, right? Mm-hmm. And I think now the FBI has a bad name again, but it's very curious because it's from the right. The far right calls it the deep state. Um but there was a point by ni- the 1970s, because of what Hoover did, um, there was a church committee that really investigated the FBI and saw they did all these unconstitutional, illegal things. But what I'll tell people is this. What the FBI did to Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X was absolutely set up the context and the milieu so they could be murdered. The absolutely. FBI, that's what they did. They contributed to the context of hate against them. They also set up, um, in Malcolm's case, they set up uh, informers and people within the Nation of Islam who f- fanned the flames of hatred against Malcolm as this kind of traitor who um, was, was uh, going to be worthy of death, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so they did that. And with Dr. King, they sent him a suicide package. They sent the, the, that Coretta guy. They sent him a package where they had surreptitiously taped him having sex with a woman who was not his wife mm-hmm. and said that, Unless you kill yourself, we're going to release this to the media. So, no, the FBI and Hoover. And again, they basically acted as a secret police, a state police that would investigate all of us, turn us against each other. They did this to the Black Panthers. That's right. They, they, They absolutely got Black Panthers murdered when Fred Hampton. And they're connected to Fred Hampton's murder, and we've all seen Judas and the Black Society, yeah. the Black, Black Messiah. Messiah yeah. when, when Fred Hampton tried to do an alliance with the Peace Stone Rangers in Chicago, it's the FBI who was snitch jacketing Fred and um, Jeff Fort. Jeff Fort was mm-hmm. head of the the Black Stone Rangers, right? Um, so the FBI, what they've done has been reprehensible, but I actually don't think enough people know. And Cointel Pro is the um, um, acronym for the Counterintelligence Program mm-hmm. that that was sent to infiltrate um, black nationalists. And they feared the rise of the Black Messiah. The movie's title is from a J. Edgar Hoover memo that said Elijah Muhammad could be it, Martin Luther King Jr. could be it, Malcolm X could be it, Stokely Carmichael could be it, Fred Hampton, yeah. Let's, the whole get, let's get all of them. Let's get all of them, absolutely. Is there an equivalent to that today? I would say that there's a lot of BLM hate there's mm-hmm. a lot of anti-BLM hate, and the the, the anti-BLM, anti uh, anti Antifa, mm-hmm. and now anti sixteen nineteen project, anti critical race theory. I'd say that if you have a different presidential administration, you're gonna get. Um, and we don't. 
I'm sure BLM leaders uh, and chapters have FBI files. You know, I'm sure of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so the equivalent is the BLM. BLM has become what black power and anti-war and uh, the so-called new left was in the 1960s to our time period today. I got two more questions for you. Um, why, why is 1963 so important to the civil rights movement? Well, I'm working on a book on this, too. Wow. I think I think 63 is hugely important. It's the year before we get legislation uh, in terms of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in 64 and 65. It's the last year that MLK, Malcolm X and JFK are all alive. Wow. OK, it's, wow, the, last, wow, wow. it's the last year. Right. Wow. Um, it's the year of Birmingham, Alabama. But it's also the year where Malcolm X's allies organized in Detroit on June 23rd what is then the largest civil rights demonstration in American history. 125,000 people come, and it's Reverend Albert Clegg who becomes the head of the Shrine of the Black Madonna by 1967. Um, it's gonna be uh, uh, James and Grace Lee Boggs, and Dr. King's gonna do his first iteration of I Have a Dream in Detroit, 125,000 people, and the folks who organize it are Malcolm X uh, disciples. Um, it's also the year that Malcolm X uh, does his message to the grassroots, where he says that uh, a revolution is not about singing, a revolution is about swinging, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when we think about 63, Medgar Evers, it's the last year Medgar Evers, the last five months, he's alive. The mm. NAACP field secretary who shot down uh, at 1 a.m in his driveway, shot through the heart by a white supremacist who doesn't go to prison for three more decades. Three more decades, he doesn't go to prison. So I think it's an extraordinary year. It's the year of James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just a, the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. It becomes the year where, it's very similar to BLM in 2020, um, there's going to be over 15,000 people arrested in a 10 week period. There's going to be hundreds of civil rights demonstrations that forced President Kennedy to come out on behalf of civil rights on June 11th, 1963. So I think 63 is one of the most important years in American history. And that's the year that Malcolm X and Martin really come to converge. Right. And one of the things I write in the book is that Birmingham radicalizes everybody. King becomes more radicalized. Malcolm becomes more radicalized. And it's the year that of the Children's Crusade in Birmingham, Alabama. There's going to be over 1,100 children, some as young as in the third grade, who are arrested for trying to desegregate the city of Alabama. People don't talk about that JFK speech enough because, you know, we always want presidents and politicians now to speak truth to power in regard to the racism. That's like the only time I've ever seen it really done correctly is when JFK did it. JFK did a brilliant speech June 11th, 1963. LBJ is going to follow up in 64 and 65. Mm -hmm. He's going to make some great speeches. But that Kennedy speech where he says that uh, America, for all its hopes and all its boasts, um, we're not going to be free until all people are free right. uh, is a huge speech. And he says that it's a moral issue, right? Uh, he says that it's as uh, clear as the Constitution. Okay. Oh. It's as clear as the Constitution mm -hmm. and as... as, as um, uh, it, it, it's basically an, an Old Testament issue. So when we think about JFK uh, in 1963, that's the speech that the movement has forced him to make, that has compelled him to make. Um, and that's a hugely important speech that people don't talk about enough. A few hours later, Medgar Evers is assassinated. Wow. Wow. My last question uh, about the sword and the shield. In the book, you lay out how they each become the other's alter ego. Essentially, to me, that's what the book is a, a ultimately about. Can, can you explain it? Absolutely. When we think about Malcolm and Martin, over time, Dr. King becomes much more of a radical and a revolutionary, speaking truth to power in an unapologetic way in the tone of Malcolm X. My great example there is when Dr. King is in Marks, Mississippi in 1968, organizing the Poor People's Campaign. He tells the poor black folks in Marks, Mississippi, that the way they are living is a crime. That's the exact language that Malcolm X used to use about this crime against black humanity that had occurred. For Malcolm, it's the ballot or the bullet speech. The ballot or the bullet speech is the first time Malcolm X acknowledges the need for radical black citizenship. He had always acknowledged the need for radical black dignity, but Malcolm hedges. He doesn't believe in American democracy, never does. He believes in what? Black people. 
He says, the reason why I think we should do the ballot or the bullet is that I want black people to have a chance to utilize this political power and see where it gets them. Remember, Malcolm X had been in prison. Malcolm X's father had been killed early. Um, he always felt it was a white supremacist attack. His mother had been institutionalized. Malcolm had seen what I call the lower frequencies of the United States of America. So he was always skeptical about democracy working the way in which white people pretended it worked, right? But what he did was he had faith in who? Black people. He was schooled by his mother, Louise Norton Little, who was from Grenada. So Malcolm has Caribbean blood mm -hmm. as well as the African, African-American blood. He was schooled by his father, uh, Earl Little. He was schooled by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. But he was also schooled by all these revolutionary leaders in the Middle East and Africa, right? So when you think about Malcolm becomes closer to King through this acknowledgement that we need to end worldwide supremacy, not just through self-defense, but we're going to need that beloved community. But Malcolm Hedges, he says, one, I only believe in black people vis-a-vis -vis this democracy thing. But two, he says that white people and his language is this sincere white people can be part of the movement. What did he define as sincere? He defined it sincere as what Du Bois called abolitionist democracy. White people who are going to be willing to put themselves on the line, right, to transform the entire world. So Du Bois always said, and W.B. Du Bois is the, the, the intellectual who was the founder of the NAACP, one of the most important intellectuals ever. But what he wrote in a book, 1935, called Black Reconstruction, was he wrote the true history of Reconstruction. He pushed back against the lost cause history that had said we were apes and monsters and we were raping white women. He showed how... Black people tried to reimagine American democracy, and the only reason the country exists in the form it exists now is because of our labor, our sweat, our sacrifice, our love, our patriotism, right? And so when we think about Malcolm and Martin, Martin becomes closer to Malcolm, where he becomes this unfettered revolutionary, he becomes a pillar of fire, an Old Testament prophet. He's Amos, he's Jeremiah, he's Moses by the end of his life. And Malcolm becomes closer to King, where he starts to say that not only is he a prosecuting attorney, he becomes black America's prime minister in the last year of his life. Malcolm X had an office at the United Nations. Malcolm X could go and speak to Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. He could speak to Namdi Azikiwe in, in um, Nigeria. He could speak to Mohamed Babu, who's the prime minister of Zanzibar. So that's when he becomes closer to Dr. King. So they really um, converge and you could see the, the, the love and admiration that Malcolm has for him when he, he tells uh, Coretta Scott how much he admires her husband mm -hmm. in Selma. And when you read the statement that King sends after Malcolm's assassination, he, he expresses his admiration and says what a, what a great man Malcolm X was, who was constantly changing. So you can see the convergence between both of them, even in their lifetimes. Let me tell you something, man. His name is Dr. Peniel Joseph. The book is The Sword and the Shield. I'm not even exaggerating when I say it's one of the best books that I've ever read <laughs> in my entire existence on this planet. I think everybody should go out there and get The Sword and the Shield right now. It explores the revolutionary lives of, of Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I, I can't wait to just read more of your stuff, Dr. Peniel. Well, thank you, uh, Charlemagne the God. It's It's been great. It's an honor. It's a pleasure to be here. You're an icon. No, um, stop. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of uh, this opportunity and to, to chop it up with you, to dialogue, especially as somebody from uh, New York City, a native New Yorker, uh, being back home. Hadn't seen my mom in 20 months. So, wow. Mami, me un pil. I love you, Mom, and, and you're the only reason that I'm here. Uh, and I always appreciate, I'm very grateful uh, for that. Uh, shout out to my daughter, Ayelet, uh, my partner, Laura, and the whole family that's in both New York and Austin, Texas as well. And give me your Twitters and Instagrams and ways to contact you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Twitter is at Peniel Joseph. That's P-E-N-I-E-L Joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H. And Instagram is Dr. Peniel Joseph. And please come back when the new book drops in the fall. That third reconstruction era, that's something that my man, uh, Reverend William Barber, has been discussing with me for a long time. So I can't wait to read that. Absolutely. I love Dr. Barber. And um, I did a, a, a talk with him before. And I, I think he's brilliant and truly inspiring. Uh, and absolutely, we are in a third reconstruction. And I can't wait to, uh, to share that. It's Dr. Peniel Joseph. It's The Breakfast Club. <laughs> 